Hello, can you hear me? Are you Lush? I'm Lush, hello. Nice to meet oh, you. You're amazing. What, this old thing? Please. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe it. You look fantastic. I feel frightfully un underdressed. Let me get a hairbrush, hold on. <laughs> you could never be underdressed, my love. Oh, I'm wearing, I'm wearing an Agnes B. Uh, shirt that I bought for my mother <laughs> 40 years ago, probably. It's I've got a wild look. More, I, I mean, here's me, you know, getting my makeup together and look at you. You just look unbelievable. Hold on, I'm cold. Hold on, I've just got to get my... Can you wait, wait one minute? Anything for you. Grab a cardigan. I'm putting this coat on now because I think it will it will probably hopefully look good on the screen. Ah. <laughs> you always look good on the screen, my love. How's that? Aren't you adorable? Does that look fun? That looks fun and look, stylish as always. Reversible. That's oh, great. darling! Is it that cold in Queensland right now? I'm in Sydney. Where oh, are yes. you? I'm in Sydney. I'm in Parramatta, honey. Oh, darling. I'm on the lower north shore. Um, uh, well, one of us has class. I don't think it's me. <laughs> oh, well, don't be ridiculous. Don't be <laughs> ridiculous. Hold on. Um, there are amazing uh, mansions around you, aren't there? A few. Not bad. One yeah. day I'll own one. Hold on. I've just got to hold. <laughs> so lush. This, um, okay, so you. Why don't we start? Absolutely. I'm pleasure. ready when I'm ready when you are. Oh, thank you so much for Lush. doing this, and thank you, Christopher. More than a pleasure. I'm just wondering whether I should do the button up for more fun. Oh, absolutely. This is only the audio, That's anyway. Fun. This is just us. Exactly. But I just like it to be glad. Well, look how you've dressed just for me. Oh, I would do anything for you. I'm just a little <laughs> bit of a fad, just a tit. Oh, good. Uh, well, we you are, uh, please. We did meet at Jim Sharman, so, yeah. A couple what? of years ago. We met at a Jim Sharman thing a couple of years ago. Oh, right. That was great. In fact, I'm going to see Jim this afternoon. Oh, give him my love. Absolutely. I will. Does he know you? Probably not. Just say Lush says hi. <laughs> okay, I will. I will. <laughs> and if he wants to come in for an interview, more than happy. All right, darling. Thank you. So we're going to start if you're okay. And so I'm just, ready. Just do my little bit of an intro. And to uh, to all of the people out there in Gay Waves land, to paraphrase the phrasing of a favourite movie riffing of mine, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, God said, let there be Nell. And there was. And she was <laughs> awesome. My wordy lordy, yes, folks, it's a huge moment for me personally, because I am speaking to little Nell. And if you don't know her as Columbia from the Rocky Horror Show, or Nurse Ansalong in Shock Treatment, or that lovely little movie Jubilee, we can't be friends anymore. But, <laughs> but I'm going to teach you if you don't know. So absolutely welcome Nell to Gay Waves. And thank you for coming. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And for those listeners out there i want you to know that lush is dressed top to toe as the most stunning transylvanian from rocky horror and i'm crazy impressed the makeup the hair the outfit look at those that eye makeups to die for bravo you must have been up at about 4 a.m getting that together no this is actually a 10 minute job i've been doing transylvanian since the 80s so i'm used to this you got it down down pat darling Bless i just you. read that it took um that it took tim curry four hours to get ready on the set which i can't remember because i was you know getting ready myself and we used to have to get there so early in the morning as all you know film folk do 
Mm. That four hours is a long time. It's a and they used to they used to um draw, you know have to have to draw the tattoos on every day. Ah, I you, thought mm. they, I thought they were temporaries. Just no, they didn't have such a thing in nineteen seventy three. No, seventy four. Yep, seventy three was the I believe the play. Yeah, the, we did the show then, and then the following year, the film, and the following year it came out. But how does a young Sydney girl get cast in a production like Rocky Horror? Tell me everything. Well, many things. First of all, I was living in London. At the time I was 20, and I was busking in the street, and Jim saw me. And the show, what has you know, he Richard O'Brien was in a production of... Um, the Unseen Hand by Sam Shepard that Jim directed at the time and the musical director on that little show. It was at the theatre upstairs of the Royal Court, which is just basically a room that each production turns into whatever they wanted to be on a shoestring budget. And um, so Richard said, you know, played the, uh, a, little, a little tape, but I think he first actually just played science fiction on the on the guitar to to uh, Richard Hartley and to Jim Sharman and had this little script anyway Jim said he he would put it on at the this sort of big room the theater up the upstairs of the Royal Court Theater and they came into the um I'm, uh, they came into the cafe I was working in as a as a, a soda jerk and asked me if I'd like to be in it well look, there I was you know all of 20 it was my first job in London and it was 18 pounds a week and we were going to rehearse for three weeks and perf and and run for three weeks so basically it was a six-week job mm -hmm. and uh anyway we opened we after three weeks rehearsal we, and during that time uh Richard wrote the script with help with um, contributions along the way very much by from the brilliant Brian Thompson, the set designer and and Jim Sharman, the director. And also uh, Jim would say, oh, you know, we need a song here or we need a song, for, we, we need like a dance routine, can you go home? And, and so Jim would just think something up and ask for it and the next day Richard would arrive with the song. So it wasn't Which even a complete a play when it was going on. No, it wasn't complete at all when when he when they committed to doing it. It was sort of that half the songs were there and very little of the script, but it was just, I mean, it's very much Richard O'Brien's baby. He, you know, did write all the songs and he wrote the script. But people, but the um <clears throat> the creative uh, contributions from Jim Sharman, Rich, uh, from Jim Sharman, Brian Thompson, Sue Blaine, and Richard Hartley. Sue Blaine was the costume designer. It was the that that creative team made it all possible. And I'm told there was not even a tap dance routine at the beginning, but you made that happen. You inspired. Uh, no, no. Oh, there was no time. There wasn't a song called The Time. There wasn't even an, a character called Columbia. Originally, there wasn't a Columbia, um, but um, Richard added a Columbia before, obviously, before rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And But there was no time warp. That was Jim deciding he wanted to... He, he wanted um, a particular... He wanted a dance number for the household staff that that being riffraff magenta in Colombia, so he he asked for that because he it was inspired by a french film he'd seen hold on sorry <laughs> springtime allergies anyway um so from that little tiny acorn a uh an oak tree has grown it has indeed and yeah, it, it it moved to the US to become the film, and most of a good portion of the original cast moved over with it. So Jim would have had pretty much all the original cast had he been allowed. But you know, twentieth century Fox insisted he cast Brad and Janet as to America as the American couple, and funny. mercifully, they were great in the roles. He cast those roles very well. 
Jim was a very imaginative, is a very imaginative cast it, caster of his, I think he said something like, you know, if you cast cast it right, you're 90% there. Because considering half of us couldn't really sing and it was a musical, that was impressive. You know, they usually go up, yes, I know, I love has come to attack. You know, I can't bear that kind of Broadway singing. They've got around it a bit, even on Broadway now. That it's, but I can't bear that sort of singing that's associated with musicals. Even though I am a big musical fan and I love everything from Rodgers and Ham, everything of Rodgers and, and Hammerstein, and all the way up to um, you know Hamilton. I so I am someone that you know who does have a lot of show tunes in my brain. In fact. <laughs> My my darling ex, who's the father of my daughter, said, "If I could just take those show tunes out of your brain, <laughs> <laughs> I think show tunes make the world go round. That's what it's all about." <laughs> <laughs> you may have an argument there, Lush. Well, if it wasn't for music, where would we be? Oh, well, music, yes, but yeah. you know, show tunes are a particular taste. I, you know, I love them. Many people cannot stick them. Love a good show but tune. Yeah, but I but then I don't like trad jazz either. Fair enough. I I can answer that. Yeah, I respect yeah. that. Totally messed with my head now. <laughs> so my next question, I had yes. a role. I had a role going. Uh, I've actually oh, this is I've never seen this in an interview anywhere, and it's just something I personally always wanted to know. At the end yeah. of the time warp, what? in the tap dance in the castle when you fall over. Was that deliberate or was that planned? Deliberate. You did. Yeah. No, if, if I'd fallen over accidentally, they wouldn't have, uh, in, you know, included it. But it didn't happen in the play, but Jim wanted that to happen. In, I think it was like, you know, at the pleasure of Riff Raff and Magenta to have me fall over, you know, getting too big for my boots sort of thing. Makes perfect sense now. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. That's just a one-off thing I've always wanted to know. Yeah. And, and so many, and I know we've got a lot to talk about because you've got a new show coming up and we will definitely get to that. But uh, people love to sing and dance and dress up to everything that you do. You are a cult. You're a cult figure. What is your sexiest Rocky moment ever? Oh. This is gay ways. Well. We can talk about anything and you can drop the F-bomb here. <laughs> oh, I, well, I, I think the, you know, when we were making the film, you've got, because that was, as, I, as we are saying, that was 1974. And people, there was no gym culture at all then. I actually, I mean, I was, I used to do dance classes, but it's just interesting that if you look at everyone's figure, none of us really, none of us were doing sit ups or anything. You, I, so when we come out in the floor show, we all look so amazing. And yet it was all just completely natural, which is rather sort of charming in retrospect. Uh, you know, the Jim couldn't, there was no such, like when Jim originally cast the Rocky for the original stage production, you know, you could, no one had muscles. He just had to find someone that was, you know, vaguely fit. And he found Raina Burton, who was a hoot. But um, so, I mean, I think that in, I think I, I look probably the, the sexiest in the floor show because everyone looks amazing. I mean, Sus you know, Susan's, everyone's figure, I can't believe it, the legs. And and Tim, he, Tim had such good legs. My mother used to say men, men have, in general have better legs than women. And I think, and ever since she said it, it's true. You'll see many more men with great legs than women. The way that she also said incredible eyelashes, boys tend to get them more than girls. This is true. Tim had great mm. legs. You had great legs. With a nip slip. Barry had right. great legs. Barry and has great Stephen legs. He had great legs. And Magenta and Richard O'Brien. And funnily enough, and you too. Jonathan Adams. Yes. Surprisingly, yeah. yes. Mm. Not, not something it, you would expect, but yeah. You know that in the, um, no. Anyway, um, yeah. Because, you know, in the stage production, the actor that played Eddie doubled up as Dr. Scott. Mm. 
and um, Meatloaf had played Eddie in Los Angeles in the Los Angeles production, which was the first production they did after London. And when he was offered the film, he was desperate to play Dr. Scott as well. And Jim said no. And, um, well, Meatloaf says that, and I'll, uh, because I'm seeing Jim later today, I'm going to ask him, you know, um, did did he regret not letting Meatloaf play that role? But I thought Jonathan Adams was brilliant in the role and also I adored Jonathan Adams as a person and we, you know, we worked together for seven months in that in the show. The show continued running, but I left after seven months. Mm. But also, also Meatloaf, the most adorable person. He who I used to see all the time. I kind of regret not you know, seeing him. You know he died of COVID. Did you know he was an anti-vaxxer? No, I did not. He was an anti-vaxxer and he died of COVID. He was an anti-vaxxer with asthma who no. died of COVID. And he had under, you know, what what is it? Under the what what is what do they keep saying? Oh you know, yeah. other problems. Did not know underlying that. problems underlying. or whatever. They, that's yeah. the word underlying. Much underlying. Like I know it sounds so funny. It doesn't underlying. I've under I've under wait there. I've underloaned some wonderful people. <laughs> I've underlined a lot of wonderful people. I think I've overloaned some. <laughs> Never getting that back. So let us move on, my darling, to your nightclub. I think yes. you opened that in 1986. Nell. I did. What an original yes. name. Tell me everything. Well, I didn't want to call it that, but the the um the married couple, Keith and Lynn McNally, who had two very successful restaurants, which remain very successful all these years later asked me if I'd like to do a nightclub with them. I happened to be visiting and staying with them. Um, and I said, yeah, I mean, but it was completely, haven't haven't done anything like that. And uh, and so we, Keith said, well, we have to find where we're going to have it this week or we're not going to do it. So, okay, no pressure. Well, we found the site the next day. It was a, uh, it had been a hardware store. And, uh, so we got the lease, you know, took the lease on it and started putting the, the place together, decorating it. And we, it wasn't till very late in the before we opened, I mean, very close to when we were getting ready to work. It was like, what the hell are we going to call this place? And they both said, I think we should call it Nels. And I was like, are you kidding? If this place isn't a success, you know, that's going to look so bad on me. I, I didn't want to know about it being called Nels. But and anyway... Yet- and yet it was bigger than studio I had no, before. I had I had no ego about it whatsoever. <laughs> it's a funny thing. It just to me it was the it's like Columbia is a set, you know, I'm not Columbia. I played Columbia mm. and I'm not that club. It had my name and I was there every night. But somehow, you know, what I'm saying is none of it fed my ego. But I adore that people get such a kick out of Rocky Horror. And I, I absolutely love everything about uh, anything you think about to do with Rocky Horror, the fans, the, you know, the devotion, the fact it's helped people with their, you know, come out if they're gay or trans or would, you know, cross dresses, whatever it is. I love that it's been so liberating for all those people and it's helped them find other you know, people who are similar to them and they've, mm. you know, found what they what they tell me is like a new family because many Americans, um, you know, come out to their families and they get become disowned. It's just tragic. But so many Americans are so conservative and, that you know, they've got a very, they still have a very high number of Bible bashers. As a rule, I'm you know compared to other countries, they're very re- religious in the most conservative fashion. Um, anyway, so I I just think it is marvelous that that little tiny show that we did at the th- at the tiny theater upstairs, which sat sixty two people, um, that it that's all the chairs they could fit in, uh, that it's become you know here we are, what getting on to fifty years later. 
and it's in fact yeah next year will be the 50th anniversary of the show mm. and um and so anyway it's just so it's all it's all marvelous to me i absolutely love it and i love meeting the fans and they're all just such I, I love hearing their stories it's very moving for me and I think you know everyone involved is very touched by the whole thing and of course no at the same time none of us can believe that that tiny show became what it is oh it's a true cult thanks to people like you I have friends around the world from you know from the 80s that are still Rocky Horror and all of the Facebook groups everything Even isn't that Rock- just the greatest it is. And the Rocky Horror Phenomenon, I'm told, is coming out next year, the documentary. Do you know Tony? I know Tony. I know Andreas, who I did the documentary. Tony. He says hi. Yeah. Oh, I love Tony. Uh, yeah, so some of the best people in the world are the people you will meet at Rocky because they're family. That's right. But I consider I am part of the family too. All right. You're, so you're- you're the weird aunt that sits at the barbecue with the Chardonnay. <laughs> no, I don't want to be the weird aunt. Well, I'm I'm family. We love the weird aunt. That's well, the Auntie Mae. Auntie Mae. Yeah, Auntie Nell. Fair enough. I'll take it. That's anyway, it's it's a wonderful situation. You are an LGBTQI plus everything icon. There's oh, not- thank you. That, I mean, that is just... I can't think of any, it means so much to me that you say that. It really does. Yeah. Every single and person anything, I know I, has I, I, like to see, I like to sort of see myself as an ambassador for the LGBTQ+. plus. You know. That's an excellent phrase, an ambassador. I like that. Yeah. So I'm going to use that at some point. So I, I also have a lot of your music that I'm going to play at the end of the show because Fever is one of my favourite songs. Oh, Thank you. Now, you know that all those songs I did were with Richard Hartley, who was the musical director of Rocky Horror, and Brian Thompson, who was the set designer. So we were doing our thing even after the film. Which is exactly how it should be. (laughs) Families never go away. Yes. (laughs) Well, not the good ones. So you do have a show coming up, I believe, which is... All's now. That ends now. That's the one. It's playing in Queensland venues at the moment, I believe, which is why I thought you were in Queensland. Tell me what people can expect. Well, the show is... Uh, the sh- Hold on, I'm just going to also add that I'm doing a... Um, on the 9th, Sunday the 9th, at 4pm, so bring a hip flask, <laughs> I am doing my first show at the Brunswick Heads Picture House which is a fabulous venue. I've been there before. Absolutely divine. Um, And here's the deal. I've been wanting for years to do a show with me talking, sharing all my photos with people because I've taken photos, you know, most of my life. Well, not not with a posh camera, but just, you know, take Instamatics. Anyway, so I've got these, you know, thousands of photos. So I thought, well, I wanted to do a show where I, you know, can share the photos and tell the story. Mm-hmm. And I was going to, I originally I thought I'll, I'll do a sort of synopsis of my life. And then I realised, are you kidding? I can only, I've only got time for two subjects. So I've chosen Rocky Horror and my, and my nightclub Nels. So it will be me talking you through, you know, the story of Rocky Horror and, behind the scenes and the same with my nightclub nails oh, with, with 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 lots of photos any secret gossip we can spread here before it gets there no darling you have to come to the show but you're in Brisbane <laughs> that's too far yeah, who's, who was sleeping with who and who was you know not speaking to who you gotta come to the show oh this is an unpaid gig I can't thing. afford that <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, the tickets are extremely fairly priced. The tickets are a very good price. The airfare, there's your problem. But next time. Wait there. Oh, I, of course. Sorry, <laughs> yes. You're in Sydney. I keep thinking in you're in, in, in Brisbane. Sorry. Yeah. 
So, and hello to Brisbane and the lovely Christian Fletcher, another great Rocky Horror fan. I think you probably know. So, everybody knows Nell. Everybody wants to know Nell. Oh, I'm just so flattered by all of this. So, if you, uh, you were also an extra in a lot of movies. I've got you down as Ken Russell in Listmania and The Wall. I I watched the wall. In I Listomania, I, you know, I wasn't an extra in Listomania. I had a scene. I was in bed with Roger Daltrey, and then and Ringo Starr comes in as the Pope. That was you. I've got to watch that again. Sorry, I hadn't. Yeah, seen. I was. Oh my god, <laughs> it was so great. I had lunch. You know, Ringo took us to the canteen. He picked up the tab <laughs> at lunch. You know. <laughs> Uh, Roger Daltrey, me and Ringo, and like, why the hell I didn't bring my camera that day? I don't know. I think I was hoping to sleep with Roger Daltrey, who had the most divine body and skin, but his wife had given birth that day, so that was that took that you know shine off that apple. Yeah, possibly. He was celebrating. He he was you know ecstatic about his new baby. It may, it may have been his first. I can't remember. And, and Ringo was, of course, as witty and amusing and is exactly how we all know him to be. I always loved Ringo. I'm glad to hear that he's as nice as he is. It, the, or the funny thing is that, not, not, it's not that funny, but the, considering how they all got together um, in their various, you know, how the Beatles came together, they were all very witty. They were, they were all witty and charming. That's pretty unusual, don't you think, for a band? It is. No egos, just nice people. It's very rare. Well, I don't know about the egos. Well, you're allowed to have an ego, but being nice is always good as well. Yeah. I mean, you never hear a bad word about George Harris. You don't really hear a bad word about any of them except the mem the, the non-member of the band, that being Yoko. Oh, we won't and, and you know what? Yeah. Well, her music is interesting. We'll say that. Well, no, she's her. Her and her music is separate to what you know the uh, her reputation to do with the band. I mean, you know, when she started. I mean, it's also obvious, but I'm talking about. But you know where I'm coming from. The band yeah. itself, we never hear a bad word really about them. John went a bit astray, you know, mentally by the with drugs for a while, whatever. But anyway, no, they're, they're, they're divine. And by the way, pretty much the same with the Rolling Stones. They're nice as well. Excellent. Well, Mick Jagger is divine and you never hear bad things about any of them. Yeah, it does my heart good to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I have one more question before we run away because I know yeah. you're on a time scale and I'm on a limited time thing. Famous nip slips. Do the swim. So that it's was unbelievable. amazing. Tell tell our listeners yeah. what happened. <laughs> okay. Well, do I hope I hope they know what we're referring to. I had pink hair at the time, <laughs> and I had a song uh, on the uh, a record art called "Do the Swim," and Janet Street Porter, who talks like this. Um, you know, she's still she's still you know on loose ladies or whatever one of those shows in in England in London and has a rights with the Daily Mail so she's very very much still out there with us I mean out you know in a prominent social way you know whatever media and she uh she's so there I was we were filming it was she had a show it was on a Sunday she said now you've only got one take so you're about to get it right. <laughs> Anyway, I'd borrowed a friend's bathing suit, which was strapless, and I just, you know, started doing my thing. And um, I could feel it falling, sliding down, but I kept pulling it up, thinking nothing had been revealed. And then it wasn't till the very end when I finished and the camera was still rolling that I looked down and saw that, in fact, it had slid past my nipples, <laughs> revealing my nipples, and burst out laughing. But it wasn't planned, and I'm going to tell you right now, I finally got, because I, was, I saw, just saw a still from the film of me doing the floor show. In fact, I think I'm rehearsing the floor show. 
I don't, I can't, I can't remember if I'm actually, if it's just me on my own rehearsing because Barry's behind me. Anyway, mm. um, and my arms are up and my le- breasts have popped out, right, mm. out of the corset that was ma- fitted to me, made for me as opposed to that swimsuit, right? And I, this has happened to me so much in my life that I've popped out of things and I finally got to the bottom. I hope I'm not boring the listeners to death to the reason why. I was asked, Trudy Styler, Sting's wife, asked me to jump out of Sting's 40th birthday cake. So, of course, what could, you know, I had to do it. <laughs> and um, it was going to be in L.A. after his concert at the Hollywood Bowl, the party, the birthday party. It was – and um, – they had a, a famous Hollywood costumier make my corset. And when I went to be measured by her and she'd made, you know, corsets for every, you can imagine all the famous old divas. She said, you, she measured me and she was, she said, you are very long between your navel and your, from here to here, but like to my neck, that, that area is much longer. Mm-hmm. The decolletage. So basically from my navel up is longer than from my navel to my crutch, that proportion. Mm. So that is why I, um, my breasts are higher <laughs> than the corsets. <laughs> People listening are going to say, don't even start now trying to justify all of these endless, you know, uh, risque exposures. But that is that I thought, well, finally I'm being told about it prior for professional it's been solved it has been solved but 49 years well actually 47 years after the first nipple slip on movies i'm okay with that <laughs> oh dear many a young lady turned over those <laughs> and a few boys probably turned back <laughs> i cannot tell you when, when you see my show you'll see so many at times me flashing i don't know what the hell it was all done with humour, but my God, I don't know what I was doing. I mean, I do know what I was doing, but I, it was all, I don't know. I, basically, every time I did anything like that on purpose, which was at my club and oh, not not just at my club, all over the shop, um, it was to make people laugh. I did it once to get it to, to get, I was shooting the rapids down the, uh, through the Grand Canyon uh, on the Colorado River. And um, it was like an eight, uh, eight, actually I did it for seven days or something. Anyway, it was just the most incredible thing to do. I didn't know anyone. I just joined this group and we were in little, we were actually in little wooden rowing boats, not those big inflatable things people go down in. But we ran out of ice and we saw another boat that we knew, they, the guides knew had ice and we were trying to get their attention and we couldn't. So I finally just lifted my shirt up. <laughs> <laughs> ice! You are so subtle. (laughs) I know. For some reason, they responded to that, but nothing, you know, they hadn't responded to anything else. Anyway, Um, we got our eyes. I can't think why. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you have made me laugh. You have made me cry when you died. Oh, God, that's a movie spoiler. If you haven't seen the Rocky Horror Show, and it's 47 years since it's been up. I you don't, don't know the spoilers. She, died. She, she just was unconscious. Yeah, we don't know. It might have been a stun gun. Who knows? It was a stun gun. That's exactly what it was. It was a stun gun. Yeah, and she's currently on the sun-drenched moons of Transylvania. Wait, I've suddenly lost your sound. I can't hear you suddenly. Wait a minute. So I sorry. Can't, uh, there I, you I, go. Can, I can hear you now. Yeah. I have lost. Um, of, anyway, yeah. I hope very much that the listeners will come to see me and come to meet me at All's Nell that ends Nell. Can you? It's Brisbane and the Gold Coast, starting yeah. with Brunswick Heads on the 9th, then the Gold Coast on the 14th, and the Brisbane on the 15th. And I'm doing two shows a, an evening show and a matinee. And all the links will be on the website for everybody who needs it. So thank you so much for your time. And it has been thank a true Thank you very, pleasure. very much for having me. And bravo yet again for your incredible output. I'm hugely impressed. You look divine. One day we shall meet and then see. <laughs>
and we eat again. And no, run out. Thank you so much Thank for your you, time. Ash. Pleasure. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Can I ask one favor before you run? Sure. Could you do a sting for us? This is Little Nell, and you're listening to Gay Waves Radio in 2SER? Absolutely. You're listening to Gay Waves Radio. 2SER FM. 2SC. S, -E S, S for Sydney, E for Echo, R for Romeo. 2SER FM. Okay. I'm going to have to write that down. I'll never get Just it go now. Gay Waves Radio. It's fine. I'm about okay. to lose my link. <laughs> okay. So. Hello, you ready? Go for it. Hello, darlings. Nell Campbell here. Yes, little Nell from the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Columbia, and you are listening to Gay Waves. And my God, are they gay? And I, my God, do they, they, in, they incite waves, tsunamis of fabulousness, and everything LGBTQ+. So remember, check us out. This is why I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Lash. Goodbye, and I hope we'll meet again. We shall Bye. meet again. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>